Hi everyone, thank you for joining me today. Thank you to the organisers at Safe Food EU for inviting me to uh, present this information to you today. So I'm just going to get the full screen on. Right, so today I'm going to be talking to you about uh, the UK food industry and give a review of the UK situation regarding SARS-CoV-2 and foodborne viruses. What's going to be covered today is a brief introduction to the main differences between neurovirus and coronavirus. A bit of a warning against misinformation and the things that that can lead to. Uh, current concerns regarding, especially at the moment, the meat industry, industry and COVID-19. Um, some guidance that's available uh, now in the UK for businesses who want to reopen. Some things that we can do in Camden BRI to help with businesses reopening, which include environmental surface monitoring and disinfectant testing, and some other virus news in brief. So just starting off with uh, the main differences really between SARS-CoV-2 and other enteric viruses. Neurovirus and hepatitis A viruses are referred to as non-enveloped viruses. Now, these viruses can be quite resistant to various treatments and to harsh environmental stresses. The strains of neurovirus and hepatitis virus of main concern originate in humans and are not known to cause illness in animals. Now, they are the main viruses of concern in terms of foodborne viral infections, although others can also cause infection in humans, such as hepatitis E virus, which affects the pork supply chain. Their main transmission route is still via human to human and surface to human contact and is via the fecal oral route. However, they can be very easily transported on the surface of foods if they become contaminated. And that can be either after handling by contaminated hands or gloves, or perhaps by contaminated irrigation water. Outbreaks have been associated with uh, human um, bodily fluid incidents on cruise ships, planes and restaurants. Now SARS-CoV-2 is referred to as an enveloped virus as opposed to an a non-enveloped virus and they're part of the Coronaviridae family of viruses. And this pertains to the structure of the virus having a lipid protein coat, which is not usually very stable and can be readily destroyed by substances which disrupt this coat. For example, greater than 60% alcohol and soap and detergents. Many coronaviruses can be traced to wild birds and include strains which cause the human cold. These viruses can cross between the species barrier and are known as zoonotic. And this term also applies to hepatitis E virus, which can be transmitted to humans via pigs and other types of game, including some deer species. And as we are all now well aware, it's inhalation of droplets from a sneeze or a cough from an infected person, which is considered to be the main transmission route of the SARS-CoV-2 virus. The main control measure regarding the risk from handling food products, which will reduce the risk from both types of viruses, is really good hand hygiene and hand washing with soap and water for at least 20 seconds. Now this of course is something anyone working in the food industry should already know, but it is surprising how many people still do not know how to do this properly. Uh, and if you do want to know how to do that properly, um, there is on the Camden BR website, there's a video showing how to wash hands correctly, especially for food business operators. If foods can be cooked thoroughly, that's the next best control measure, certainly for enteric viruses as well as for coronaviruses. Alcohol gel is also known to destroy coronaviruses, but is much less effective against enteric viruses, such as norovirus. And this is a point where there has been some confusion, since many are aware already that norovirus is not eliminated by alcohol gel, but 
but are getting confused as to why it inactivates coronavirus. And again, the reason is because of the structure of the coronavirus, which has a lipid protein layer that's easily disrupted by the detergents and alcohol greater than 60% in strength. Good respiratory hygiene has also been highlighted in the fight against COVID-19. So just to summarize, the main risk of illness associated with consumption of foods remains, in the microbiological area at least, ingestion of bacterial and viral pathogens. However, it is likely that the increased awareness of foodborne viruses such as norovirus and hepatitis A virus and hepatitis E virus has had many concluding that SARS-CoV-2 could potentially be a foodborne hazard as well. Hence, my increased involvement in trying to understand the risks to the food industry, which has been ever-changing over the past few months. There have been reports that have shown that SARS-CoV-2 may replicate in the intestinal tract as well. However, it's still not thought that this poses a risk to health in the same way as inhaling the virus does. The information is also useful for tracking the virus in the environment and in populations. Now, safety, of course, shouldn't just always be looked at in terms of the physical aspects. Reconfigured and fabricated information can be very dangerous. This has really been brought to the fore during this pandemic and has caused a considerable amount of issues. Many people have a lack of trust and knowing where to find accurate and reliable information in this world that's already filled with masses of information which originates from many different sources is a continual problem. There have been many claims made with no scientific backing, but even when it seems obvious, there are people who will not listen to logic, but blindly follow, pe follow people like media stars, celebrities, and even politicians who can be uninformed or indeed just give their own opinion on a matter. Some people look to their own social media circle for answers and decide not to listen to the science. And this is where it can be a real challenge for businesses who need to ensure the correct messages and facts are communicated in a clear way to employees. So in this top slides here, just two examples out of many, um, one being that there was a news report edited to show that bananas defend against COVID-19 and that breathing in hot hair from saunas and hair dryers um, being able to prevent and treat COVID-19. So as an example of uh, misinformation, uh, I'm sure you've probably all seen this, after Donald Trump suggested that uncontrolled use of disinfectants was an idea, or might be an idea, there were reports of people starting to wash their fruits and vegetables with bleach, and soaps and other detergents in the hope that this would prevent illness from the virus. Now there have been reports of people gargling with bleach solution, solutions because they believe that doing so would protect them from the virus. But my message all along to the industry members who have had questions regarding disinfectants has been to look solely at the regulatory authorities' websites, such as WHO, the CDC, the ECDC, FSA, Public Health England, etc., for advice on the correct dis disinfectants to use and their correct application. Now, interestingly, Belgium's Poison Control Centre recorded an increase of 15% in the number of calls it receives since the COVID-19 outbreak in mid-March, as people have increasingly started experimenting with hazardous substances. Dominique van Dijk, who is Deputy Director of the Poison Control Centre, stated, We have never seen such a significant increase in the history of the Poison Control Centre. He said that we always see an increase in the number of calls during holiday periods, but in coronavirus times, there's another 15 to 20% on top of that, which is very significant. People are much more concerned with cleaning and hygiene. They clean more often with stronger products or combinations of different products. That's not always a good idea because chemical vapors that can be very irritating can arise, he said. He also mentioned that in many cases, people call the emergency line because they attempted to disinfect their hands with bleach, methanol, or wash their bodies with essential oils. We even got calls from people who had, who had put bleach in their bath water to be able to disinfect their whole bodies. 
So he said, for God's sake, don't do that, he told his local news outlets. Now, we ourselves at Camden BRI have been approached to endorse various products, some of which are clearly not suitable for use in ho on humans. So our message all along to industry members, again, has been to look only to the regulatory authorities' websites and not to take notice of messages in social media, which may be unregulated, as well as to make sure that thorough testing of a product is undertaken before releasing it to the public, which may include testing against international standard methods. And as you can see in this slide here, uh, the makers of Lysol and Dettol, um, uh, they had to put out uh, uh, on social media sites that you should never ingest bleach, never inhale bleach, and always use bleach safely and disinfecting. So moving on again to other current issues in the food industry, we have of course very recently uh, seen a number of reports from different countries all over the world where there has been a number of localized outbreaks involving meat processing facilities. Now, due to the sheer number of reports involving these facilities, I thought it would be a good idea just to look more closely as to why this may be happening. So there are about five general conditions which make these environments ideal for the spread of the virus. Cold conditions, close proximity of workers, humidity levels, air movement, and a noisy environment. <clears throat> and I'm just going to go through each of these conditions in turn. So starting off with a refrigerated environment, why can that be a problem? Well, most viruses will remain infectious for longer periods when they are chilled or frozen compared to at ambient temperatures. That's a known fact. There have been studies performed on other similar viruses to SARS-CoV-2, which have shown that they can remain infectious for up to 28 days at refrigeration temperatures. Of course, we have to remember that in laboratories which handle viruses, we freeze them to store them. So clearly being kept in cold conditions is an ideal environment for viruses such as this. We know, of course, of the issues related to physical distancing, and this is especially challenging in meat processing plants, especially if production has not slowed down to any degree where workers can be spread further apart from each other. Not all processing plants may have immediately put up screens and uh, put in place physical distancing measures. And this would probably be very, be very difficult in this environment. Wearing masks will no doubt help, but the work in these plants can be very physical and it may be difficult to breathe when uh, you know, lots of physical exertion is maintained for long periods of time. There may also be an issues with workers having to share transport to and from the site as well as shared accommodation as well between workers, which may be cramped. <clears throat> now going hand in hand with refrigeration temperatures is humidity. Viruses like cold, humid environments and in the meat processing plants, the humidity levels can sometimes be very high in order to prevent loss of weight from meat. Again, studies have reported that inactivation of viruses will take longer at chilled human temperatures. And in a meat processing plant, depending on which part you're in, the uh, humidity can range between around about 45 to 95% humidity. So clearly that could be an additional factor. The airflow in meat processing plants can also be, can be a significant factor in helping to keep contamination airborne. A report in the journal Nature very recently reported on the levels of SARS-CoV-2 that can be found in hospitalized patient sputum. And the numbers of particles were up to about 2 billion per milliliter. So again, this goes hand in hand with the final point here, which is a noisy environment. Movement of air and having to talk loudly or even shout to be heard in some parts of the plant may lead to contaminated droplets from infectious individuals remaining airborne and being distributed over large areas. An interesting article was regarding speech super emitters and they are being capable of producing a, a cloud of about 6,000 aerosol particles that could potentially be inhaled by someone else. 
Of course, when no one is showing symptoms, there may be a false sense of security that may lead to people becoming complacent in their use of PPE. However, I think that there may be a huge underestimation of the number of asymptomatic people who could present just as much of a risk of spreading the virus as those who do show symptoms. So that's just a roundup of the main factors which may be a part of the reason why meat processing facilities are seeing this spike in the number of cases. So moving on to further current issues, and this includes the problems for exporters of frozen fish to China due to the increase of positive cases being linked to Beijing Xinfandi, Xinfadi agricultural market, where salmon was implicated due to the virus being detected on a chopping board where they were preparing imported frozen salmon. Now, it's quite hard to picture the size of this kind of uh, facility, but if you convert 112 hectares, which is the, um, uh, the size of this market, into football fields. It's actually about 209 football fields in size. You have huge numbers of people going through these facilities every day. Uh, I mean, before they, they shut it down on the 13th of June, um, there was about 10,000 visitors going through prior to suspension of activities. So it's no surprise that there have been issues there. I mean, they, they trade tons, thousands of tons of food every single day to try and meet the demands of the Beijing population. So what exactly was the problem in this Beijing market? Well, their run of 55 days without any new infections was brought to an abrupt halt when nearly 80 new local cases were linked to this market. They started to take many different samples from people and from surfaces and they detected the virus on the surface of a chopping board used to prepare imported frozen salmon. Media picked up on this very quickly. And this eventually led to sushi restaurants being shut down and companies exporting salmon to China with a big problem on their hands since there was suddenly a lack of demand for the fish. The likelihood of the fish being the problem though is very low since other countries handling the same exported fish have not been reporting any problems. So exactly where the virus originated is still unknown. However, it's unlikely to be the fish and more likely to be brought into the market by visitors. The most likely cause epidem epidemiologists suggest is the sheer volume of people working and passing through the market, which operates under suboptimal hygienic conditions, as well as having a nice humid and chilled air environment, which as we have already discussed is ideal for survivor, survival of viruses. Now this picture of a meat section in the market well illustrates the potential problems. There's meat on open counters and a dark and cold environment. Although we can see this picture has been taken of everyone wearing face masks and fairly well separated apart. We don't know if this is an official photograph or if it's one being um, just taken ad hoc, but it certainly doesn't look as though there should be as much of a problem as there is. But as you can see, it's re relatively dark, cold conditions um, within that particular uh, environment. Now, more recently, there have been inquiries regarding how to minimize the risks for a returning workforce. In general, this will depend on the individual workplace and the updating of risk assessments to take into account additional measures required to counteract the risks from COVID-19. Now, this may include both physical and procedural controls. I think key is good communication of any changes to the workforce to ensure that no misinformation is being circulated and the extra training is given if it's required. For example, in terms of how to physical distance making sure that distancing procedures are in place and increased hand washing practices and everything that goes along with that, maybe including enhanced cleaning procedures. And indeed, one of the questions I got was, how do we implement a safe return to working environment when up to 500 people are going to be returning to their work? So it's things like that that we have to think about. So what's in place? Well, recently the UK Food Standards Agency has published new guidance for the food industry. 
titled Reopening and Adapting Your Food Business During COVID-19. The link can be found at the bottom of the slide. Now, one of the main themes of this guidance is to ensure that risk assessments are updated to address the risks from COVID-19 and to ensure that these changes are documented in relation to existing HACCP procedures. So, as we can see from this slide here, we um, understand this guidance that is designed for employers, employees and the self-employed to understand how to work safely during the ongoing pandemic. Uh, and yeah, just to reiterate that any document changes to HACCP, if they're required, may need to be uh, informed to the local food authority if there's any major changes. I'd just like to now briefly mention some of the things that we have been doing at Camden BRI to help businesses make sure that they are doing everything that they can to minimize the risks when they reopen. So um, one of my colleagues, Annette Sansom, in the microbiology department at Camden BRI has developed a new test for the determining of the e efficacy of disinfectants and sanitizers using a surrogate virus, which is very similar in size and structure to SARS-CoV-2. It, it is an enveloped bacteriophage. Now, many current methodologies concentrate on the use of viruses, which are non-enveloped. So this test is more relevant to those wishing to test the efficacy of their hand sanitizers or disinfectants in the context of this current outbreak. And one of the benefits of this particular test is that because it uses a, a surrogate um, bacteriophage, which is completely safe to use for humans, we can actually use this on site at factories um, to be able to apply it to a surface and to validate a cleaning regime that it works in removing this type of virus from the surface. So if you want more information on this type of service, please contact Annette directly or our customer inquiry team. Another area where we have had lots of interest is for environmental monitoring for SARS-CoV-2. Now at the moment, nearly all efforts have been towards prioritizing patient samples, which of course is still the number one priority. However, there is also a need to address the issue of those businesses who will be reopening now or in the very near future. These will include virtually anywhere that there will be a large number of people returning to work. There may be concerns regarding the, F the efficiency of the cleaning procedures in place and efforts might need to be taken to reassure the workforce that all is being done to minimize the risk to them. Now, this is a new environmental swabbing service and can supplement existing environmental monitoring. The focus can be on uh, frequently touched surfaces in areas around the workplace. So uh, things like uh, keyboard surfaces, door handles, telephones, countertops, toilet facilities, uh, everywhere where that's basically frequently touched uh, by either workplace staff or employees or perhaps customers. The test has been verified by recovering a heat inactivated strain of SARS-CoV-2 from stainless steel and from polypropylene surfaces. So if you do want more information on this particular test, again, please either contact support or myself directly. My details are there at the bottom of the slide. Now, finally, I just wanted to highlight the recent report released by the UK Food Standards Agency, which was somewhat overshadowed by COVID-19, but which is of great relevance still to the food industry. So this report was published in February 2020, um, where it gave new estimates of numbers of foodborne illnesses, which were reported back in February. And that revealed that the numbers of illness in the UK from foodborne pathogens more than doubled from 1 million in 2009 to around about 2.4 million cases now. Now, norovirus, interestingly, was revealed to cause the biggest number of foodborne related illnesses, estimated at about 383 thousand cases per year. The risks were ranked in terms of percent of cases related to type of risk, with most of the risk being eating out at 37% of cases, le eating lettuce at 30% of the total number of foodborne cases, takeaways 26%, followed by raspberries at retail 4% of cases and oysters at 3% of cases. 
Now, consumption levels were taken into consideration when estimating these figures. Now, another um, report that was published this time in March 2020 by the UK FSA was the societal burden of foodborne illnesses in the UK. And this was a comprehensive estimate of the societal burden caused by illnesses in the UK with a model being produced using data obtained in 2018. I just wanted to go over the main points of this um, here. They estimated that a financial burden due to the 13 main foodborne pathogens is around about three billion pounds, with norovirus imposing the greatest burden with an annual estimated cost of 1.68 billion pounds, followed by Compilobacter species of 0.71 billion pounds and Salmonella species of 0.21 billion. Unidentified pathogens causing foodborne illness was equal to around £6 billion. So the headline figure of approximately £9 billion in total. 60% of the foodborne illness cases have been attributed to no specific pathogen. So where are we then with regards to foodborne viruses? Well, we've got new knowledge, but not necessarily new answers. Norovirus is still not regulated. There's no current legislation to say that producers or retailers or anyone else uh, must test their products in any part of the supply chain. The NOVA study showed that lettuces and raspberries can carry the virus. With consumption levels, especially in lettuce, being very high, that leads to a, a large number of people being um, potentially infected. These estimates show that on average, around about 315 people may be infected with norovirus by eating lettuce every single day. So my question is, is this acceptable? We are wanting to be able to produce safe food. So is having around about 1,315 people every day becoming ill, uh, is that justifying the fact that there's no testing being done? From farm to retail, greater emphasis really needs to be placed on being able to identify the main transmission points. So, you know, we've got a good idea that it's from contaminated irrigation waters, but it's from handless hands, the hygienic infrastructure on farms. So the question is, how can that be controlled better to reduce the numbers of people that could potentially be infected from norovirus? And that's what we're hoping that the regulators will uh, seek to answer in the future as a result of the results from these studies. So finally, what can Camden BRI help with in regards to this particular issue? Well, we are still the only laboratory in the UK who can analyse fresh and frozen produce for norovirus and hepatitis A virus, and we are UCAS accredited for this analysis. We can also analyse pork products for the presence of hepatitis E virus, for which there is currently no standard method available. Just to let you know as well, I'm currently involved in two FSA funded projects, one on a thermal death model, um, which is due to be finished very soon. Um, and we are also the coordinating uh, partner for a project to um, optimize and standardize detection methods for hepatitis E virus in pork products and we're just about six months through that already. So please be aware that um, I probably won't be able to give a huge number of updates on these particular projects, but they are underway and is certainly something the FSA is looking at in terms of hepatitis E um, as a priority. So for more information on any of the services that we can provide, please feel free to contact, contact us directly or through the support email. And so finally, thank you very much for listening and I look forward to any questions you may have. Thank you very much.